Yes. Amen. Yeah, Heavenly Father, Lord, we come humbly into your presence. Thank you to praise you for the blessing of this beautiful Sabbath day. Thank you, Lord, for the care that you have given us. Thank you for <clears throat> those that have been on the road this day for the traveling mercies. Thank you for your love, your kindness, your grace, and your, and your mercy that you bestow upon us each and every day. We invite your presence to be with us right now, oh, Father. And I pray that as um, Brother Troy and I um, share that you need um, uh, point our lips, Father, and that it may be your words, not ours. Um, that your name may be Lord, Father. And we just want to thank you as well. And we will also be joining us as well and those that are here with us today. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 And well, today, um, as we're going down our list, I actually... <laughs> I guess we're going up our list um, because we're going to be talking about cancer. And um, the reason why I didn't do it earlier was because I wanted to do a little bit more detailed information on, on cancer. Um, but um, I think we already went down the list and our cancer was the last one. Um, so with that, let me go ahead and minimize this. And um, cancer. And on page 313 of Ministry of Healing, we read this intriguing statement. Flesh was never the best food, but its use is now doubly objectionable since diseasing animals is so rapidly increasing. Those who use flesh foods little know what they are eating. Often if they could see the animals living and know the quality of the meat they eat, they would turn from it with loathing. People are continually eating flesh that is filled, uh, flesh that is filled with tuberculosis and cancerous germs. Tuberculosis, cancer, and other fatal diseases are thus communicated. Mm. So, over here, the above claims that cancer is caused by a germ which is some sort of microorganism like a bacteria or fungus or virus, which hmm, uh, makes me think about the, the coronavirus, you know, um, something like that. Maybe cancer came about in a similar way. <laughs> I don't know, something to think about because so many people are suffering from cancer. And say, of course, it's common knowledge in today's medical and scientific communities that viruses cause cancer, but it wasn't common knowledge back then. And to illustrate, consider the following. Rose Francis Payton, an American medical researcher, proved that viruses cause some types of cancer. In 1910, Rose ground up a cancerous tumor from a chicken and filtered out everything larger than a virus. The resulting liquid produced cancer when injected into other chickens. And um, another mm. thing, when injected, hmm, another thing to think about. For many years, you know, it's like when you get the, <laughs> the vaccine and they inject the virus on you. Um, and um, for many years, scientists scoffed at Rouse's discovery. The scientists believe cancer could not be caused by a virus because the disease is not contagious. In 1966, Rouse chaired the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine for his work. Rouse Francis Payne, World Book Encyclopedia. <clears throat> That's where you can find this. So in 1910, a Maverick medical researcher proposed that cancer was caused by a virus and could be transmitted from chicken to chicken. He was subsequently derided by the scientific community for proposing such a uh, ludicrous idea and then waited 56 years before being awarded his Nobel Prize. Uh, so do you suppose that perhaps Mr. Rouse plagiarized his Nobel idea from Ministry of Healing? Because um, that's where it was. Um, and also more importantly, how in the world the LNY know that cancer is caused by an infectious agent? So, and we know that she was inspired um, by the Lord. So we know that God actually revealed that to her. 
So he came from God, um, ultimately. Mm -hmm. so that's a little um, information there. Uh, some types of cancers include breast cancer, prostate cancer, skin cancer, colon cancer, liver and pancreatic cancer, and much more. There's a lot more cancers. People with cancer must avoid white sugar, white bread, white rice, white pasta. Avoid processed foods, cakes, snacks, all meats and meat products, especially sausages, um, hot dogs, um, those um, meat that are for sandwich meat. They are very, very, very bad. And also a lot of things that people don't think about is household products and chemicals, you know, uh, that they need to avoid that causes cancer. Lawn and garden products. Um, there was one that um, had a recall because it was causing cancer. Uh, cosmetics and personal care products, um, what they're made of. Cleaning products, plastics with BPA. So a lot of these things need to be avoided and replaced with natural. Uh, we can always make some natural, you know, lawn and garden products. Um, those that wear cosmetics, um, we don't, of course, but um, those that do, um, you can try natural things as well and personal care products too, uh, cleaning products. And um, instead of plastics, we can use the, the glass. So we have a cancer diet and, and the herbs that are good, like turmeric, blueberries, tomatoes, garlic, cayenne pepper. And there goes the garlic and cayenne pepper. So mm -hmm. <laughs> those that are drinking that garlic and cayenne pepper, they're protecting themselves from cancer too, not just um, the cold and boosting the immune system. It is very Amen. good. Milk, pizza, blood root, fever few, uh, butcher's broom, astragalus, sweet potatoes, squash, broccoli, vitamin D, soursop. Soursop is very, very good for cancer. Um, so you can make also a juice consisting of beets, carrots, celery, potatoes, and radish. And you can drink it twice and it's very good. And of course, alkalines in your body and drinking the green juices like wheatgrass and barley grass. We know barley grass has vitamin B17, which is very good to kill the cancer cells. The miracle drink, beets, carrots, celery, and apple juice. Drink lots of water with lemon every day to alkalize your body. Or go on a raw food diet. That is one of the best things that people that have cancer can do is go on a raw food diet. It's very, very good. And of course, lots of leafy green vegetables, coffee animals um, are very good too. Uh, and then you can also make a tea consisting of garlic, ginger, turmeric, oregano. Um, you know, clean the garlic and um, um, and you, you, you take the outer skin off, but you leave the inner skin and um, you wash it, you smash it, rinse the turmeric and ginger, cut it in pieces and crush it, rinse the oregano leaves and put all the ingredients in a medium large pot, boil for 15 minutes. And in a cup, you can add a pinch, there goes a cayenne pepper again, um, squeeze lemon and a pinch optional of Himalayan salt. Now uh, it's optional, but um, I like it with it because it gives it such a good taste. Um, and I know Sis Demetra knows what I'm talking about because um, she has done this tea before and um, it, it does taste pretty good and it's amazing. It's not just good for cancer, but it's good for the circulation, inflammation, high blood pressure. It's good for so many, so many things. So that's a Very good thing well. you can make and it tastes good. Now, uh, we have some cancer fighting herbs like, um, here you go, the turmeric again. Um, it's a yellow curry powder, but I like using the root uh, that is shown to inhibit growth of cancer cells. And it's also anti-inflammatory. Ginger, it's antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties protect against cancer. Um, and it's also used, it's mainly known for herbal rem remedy for upset stomach and nausea. And um, it can serve as an appetite stimulant, but it's also very good for cancer. Cayenne pepper. This hot pepper contains capsaicin, a powerful antioxidant that helps with weight loss, and it is anti-inflammatory food. Cayenne also contains beta carotene. It is also known to be toxic to cancer cells and helps mm. prevent growth of cancer cells. 
So keep taking that cayenne pepper, it's very good. Saffron, <laughs> and we know this is the most expensive spice there is, but it's packed a good punch. It contains uh, crocins, water-soluble carotenoids that may inhibit tumor growth and progression of cancer. The oregano, the richest source of antioxidant among herbs, slows cancer growth and promotes apoptosis, cell death. In other words, it kills the cell, um, cancerous cells, and it carries antibacterial properties and is a natural disinfectant. And here goes a famous garlic, we couldn't leave it out, right? The most powerful mm -hmm. anti-cancer spice is part of the cancer-fighting alien group, which is onions, shallots, scallions, leeks, and chives. Garlic helps boost the immune system to help fight disease, as well as colds and flu. It also decreases the growth of cancer cells. So mm. take one uh, daily dose, one clove, and remember to chop and stop, which means chop and then let it sit for 10 minutes before using to allow for the formation of allicin enzymes. So that right there is a good way um, to use the garlic. And the best remedy for cancer, of course, we cannot leave it behind. Um, you know, I went to, um, it was a camp meeting in Kansas and uh, Maimon Wilson was there that day. He was one of the guest speakers. And he was talking about, about this, about um, Hezekiah. Uh, he was talking that the, um, uh, the boy that he had was actually cancer. Uh, so 2 Kings 20, 1, 5, and 7, in those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thou sayest the Lord, set thy house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. And also, that's the one thing that we need to do as well, set our house in order. Make sure that we have our houses in order always. Um, Amen. It says, turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, Thou sayest the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard <laughs> thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day, thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. So God sees our tears always. There's no one tear that goes unnoticed. Um, mm -hmm. Isaiah said, take a lump of figs. And they took and laid it on the boil, and he recovered. So figs, hmm, it makes you think, right, how good figs are. It also gives you a lot of strength and energy. Um, the figs are very, very good. And Jeremiah 30, 17, for I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord. Um, God, the Lord, is our ultimate healer. And we need to Amen. put us, our lives, our bodies, and everything in his hands. And um, he promised that he will restore health unto us. And um, he's not a man that he should lie, right? Um, Amen. Right. So praise the Lord for his beautiful promises. So thank you all very much. And I pray that um, these recommendations... Um, those, if you know people that are suffering from cancer, um, it's good to pass this along to them. So thank you. May you all be blessed. Amen. 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 Thank you for that, uh, Sister Betty. Very important. You're welcome. Uh, especially during times that we're in to take care of our health. And one of the things that the Lord was telling me as it relates to that, that's health being the entering wedge is that one reason we need to do health reform and take care of ourselves because we know that the day is coming when we won't be able to buy or sell and all our earthly support will be cut off. We won't be uh, able to go to the doctor or the dentist or anything. So we need to start getting these old bodies together now. And so when that time comes, uh, we'll be able to take care of ourselves because we've developed an understanding of how the body works. Amen. Amen. Yeah, the word, word of the Lord says it is God's will that we be in good health and prosper even as our soul prospers. Mm -hmm. So not only does the Lord want us to learn spiritually, he, uh, he wants us to also uh, be healthy. And that gives the Holy Spirit a good strong body to work with. But let's have a word of prayer. We get, get to the study and uh, See what God has to say to us today.
Dear Heavenly Father, we just, again, thank you for your great love and kindness. Thank you for the brothers and sisters who were able to get on. Also lifting up my brother, uh, who is a little tired today and maybe ill, but Father God, we thank you for your divine hand of love and healing power. And Father God, we realize and know even if you don't heal us, Lord, we know that you're able. Mm -hmm. And so, Father God, we thank you for being a God who uh, hears and answers our prayers. Uh, Lord, you want us really to get on your nerve. You want us to keep at you. You don't want us to rest, uh, to allow you to rest, Heavenly Father, but to continue to uh, bring our petitions to you. You're anxious to hear what your children have to say, Father God. You are such an attentive and caring Father. Lord, we thank you today. We ask that your spirit be upon each of us. Lord, anoint your word today. Forgive us, O Lord, of our sins and our transgressions. Uh, we realize that we cannot draw a nigh unto thee unless we sanctify ourselves. So, Father God, we ask that our hearts be cleansed so that we can see you more clearly. Thank you, O Lord, for your word. And Lord, I realize that I'm not the teacher, but you're the teacher. So we're asking that you lead, guide, and direct our minds today as we study your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And so we are on the Church of Pergamos, which is the church right after Smyrna. And one of the things that I saw was, one, when the church has begun, the Church of Ephesus, we know that they were uh, zealous. And uh, not only that, uh, something happened in the Church of Ephesus is that they lost their first love. And then we come to the Church of Smyrna. And God gives his commendations, and he says this, he says this to the church of Samaria, to the angel of the church of Samaria, these things says the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulations and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy, blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. And so they went through a time period of persecution which lasted approximately 10 years, from about 303 to about 313. And at 313, we pick up with the Church of Pergamos, which is the church right after Smyrna. And uh, I got this from Strong's Concordance, the Greek 444. The Greek word means Pergamos, I'm speaking of means a uh, council. It also means high or elevation. Okay? And the time period of that church was from about 313 AD. And in th 313 AD, I found that uh, something happened during that time period uh, called the Edict of Milan. The Edict of Milan. And I have a quote pertaining to that that was off the internet even though I know you got to be careful with things you get off the internet, but this is a good quote. It says, it came out of two men, a two-man summit in northern Italy, city of Milan, in January 313. Two men were the Roman emperors. One, Constantine, ruling the West, and, Licini and Licinius, the East. They met under happy auspices which is like uh, auspices is like uh, omen or, you know, uh, you know, something that would draw together to uh, work jointly. So they, they were under happy auspices. After years of power struggles for the imperial purple, the Roman world enjoyed a degree of peace. And after the failure of the great persecution uh, initiated by Emperors Diocletian and Galerius in 303 through 304, the Christian church had begun to recover its stability. Constantine and Licinius turned their minds to matters affecting the general war welfare of the empire. They determined, first of all, to attend to the reverence pay paid to the divinity. This required a guarantee of full religious freedom to Christians. 
setting them on a par with those who follow other religions. The so-called Edict of Milan provided, provided for this. It marks the Roman emperor's final abandonment of policies of persecution of Christians. The age of martyrdom was at an end. The transition to the era of Christian empire had begun. And this happened during the time period of 313, during the Edict of Milan. And so after this happened uh, to the Church of Pergamos, after the persecution of the previous church period uh, stopped in the year 313, uh, 313, what happened to the Church of Pergamos after the persecution of previous church periods and stopped in the year 313? Well, what we're really what I'm trying to say is after all of the persecution has stopped with uh, during the time period of Samarina and Constantine and Licinius, when they come on the scene with the Edict of Milan and all of the persecution stopped, uh, what I noticed was the church got lax, very lax. And so here's a quote that I found from the Great Controversy, which I wish I could put it on the screen, but it's Great Controversy, page 49, paragraph 2, and I'm taking a portion of that as it relates to the Edict of Milan. That's Great Controversy, page 49, paragraph 2. It says this, Little by little, at first, in stealth and silence, and then more openly, as it increased in strength and gained control of the minds of men, the mystery of iniquity carried forward its deceptive and blasphemous work. Almost imperceptibly, the customs of heathenism found their way into the Christian church. The spirit of compromise and conformity was restrained for a time by the fierce persecution during the Samar uh, Samaritan period. Right, which the church endured under paganism. But as persecution ceased during the 313 and 313 AD under the Edict of Milan, and Christianity entered the courts and palaces of kings, she laid aside the humble simplicity of Christ and his apostles for the pomp and pride of pagan priests and rulers. And in place of the requirements of God, which we know our one, the commandments of God, she substituted human theories and traditions. The nominal conversion of Constantine in the early part of the fourth century caused great rejoicing, and the world, cloaked with a form of righteousness, walked into the church. Now the work of corruption rapidly progressed. Paganism, while appearing to be vanquished, became the conqueror. Her spirit controlled the church adoptions, ceremonies, and superstitions were incorporated into the faith and worship of professed and the worship of professed followers of Christ. In other words, they began to do something similar that we're going to learn uh, that Balaam called the children of Israel to do as we move forward in this study. Okay. So here's a question. How was Jesus described to the Church of Pergamos in Revelations 2.12? How was he described to the Church of Pergamos? He that has the sharp sickle, sharp sword with two edges. Amen. So he's described as a sharp sword with two edges. And what does these two edges represent? According to somebody get uh, Hebrews 4.12, Matthew 4. We're going to take verses 4, 7, and 10. I got Matthew 4. All right. I have Hebrews 4, 12. Thank you, sister. Praise God. Give me uh, Matthew 4, and we'll read verses 4, 7, and 10. <clears throat> but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Verse 7. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And verse 10, Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt, not, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, 
and him only shalt thou serve. And Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Amen. So another purpose for the two-edged sword is what? Is a discerner of the thoughts, intents of the heart. Mm. Okay. What else? Anybody? Mm. Mm. Okay. Anybody got anything else? Dividing the sound of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and it is the discerner of thoughts and the intents of our hearts. The word of God reveals us, reveals to us our true nature. Okay. Here's another question that I wrote down. It says this, and I take this thought. Actually, this question came because I found something in uh, uh, Miller's Works, Volumes 2. And it's called the, the Evidence from Scripture and History of the Second Coming of Christ about the year 1843, okay? Even though the Church of Pergamos was living amongst paganisms, paganism, what are we told concerning the faith, who, uh, concerning the faithful who lived during that time period according to Revelation 2.13, which says, I know thy works, where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest, fast my name and has not denied my faith even in, in those days where Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. And I'm connecting this because in this particular in this particular quote from William Miller works volume two, he says this, even in those days where Antipas, Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth, it is supposed, it is supposed that Antipas was not an individual, but a class mm -hmm. of men who opposed the power of the bishops or popes in that day. Being a combination of two words, anti, which is oppose, and papas, father or pope. Mm. So Antipas. Hmm. Opposed to the popes. Interesting. Many of them, yes, it is. And many of them suffered martyrdom at that time in Constantinople and Rome, where the bishops and popes began to exercise the power, which soon after brought into subjection the kings of the earth and trampled on the right of the Church of Christ. And for myself, I see no reason to reject this explanation of the word Antipas in this text. And I'm quoting him. As the history of those times are perfectly silent respecting such an individual as is here named, yet many who oppose the worship of saints in pictures and the infallibility of the bishops of Rome were excommunicated, persecuted, and finally driven out from among men. And in the next age of the church had to flee into the wilderness all this happened in the kingdom of Rome, where Satan dwelleth. And that's from the pioneers. That's uh, Miller's Works, if you want to check that out. Miller's Works, volume two, uh, page 138, paragraph two. And I have to do that because I don't have any PowerPoints, so I have to give it to you. Okay. And so what does the Bible mean? What does the Bible mean when it talks about the seed of Satan in Revelations 2.13? And someone give for me 2 Thessalonians 2.4. So we're talking about where seed, Satan dwelleth, okay? Uh, where his seat is. 
about the seed of Satan. Let's look at Thessalonians 2, 4. 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians, a couple books back. Chapter 2, verse 4. Who opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped, so that he as God sitted in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Amen. You see that? And I want to also connect that thought to what Sister Montague read to us from uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, from the Great Controversy, uh, page 50. Paragraph one, she says this, this compromise between paganism and Christianity resulted in the development of the man of sin. Remember in Daniel, the iron and the clay? Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Crafts, yeah. eight crafts. Right? Okay. And that resulted in the man of sin, foretold in prophecy as opposing and, and exalting himself above God. The gigantic system of false religion is a masterpiece of Satan's power, a monument of his efforts to seat himself upon the throne to rule the earth according <laughs> to his will. See? And so when we are surrendering to seal, to surrendering to sin, we are uh, submitting to the control and will of Satan. That's what Satan would have us to do, right? Yeah. This is, this is one way that he gets us to bow to him. Okay? It says, what words or rebuke did Jesus give to the church of Pergamos in Revelations 14? It says, <clears throat> but I have a few things against thee. Yes. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Amen. And that uh, to commit fornication, all of that, that's very important. So this doctrine of Balaam, mm -hmm. which the church of Pergamos held, what was it? Let's look at uh let's look at a couple of things. One, let's look at Numbers 31. We're gonna look at verses 15 and 16. And also, same book, chapter 25, verses 1 and 2. And then I have a quote from Patriarchs and Prophets that I would like to connect to those scriptures. 31. So we're talking about the doctrine of Balaam, right? What was Balaam's doctrine which the church of Pergamos held? The church of Pergamos held this doctrine, the Bible says. What, what is this doctrine that the church of Peg, uh, Pergamos held? Numbers 31 what? Verses 15, 16, L. Okay, Numbers 31, 15, 16. And Moses said unto them, Have ye saved all the women alive? Behold, they caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Amen. 25, 1 and 2. That was 25, 1 and 2? Yes, yes, ma'am. Numbers 25. And Israel one and two. abode. Go ahead. And Israel abode in, I can't see this word, Shittim. Shittim. And yeah. the people began to commit boredom with the daughter of Mob. And they called the people 
unto the sacrifices of their gods, and their people did eat. They bowed down to their gods. Amen. So hmm. we see what's happening. Now, I want to take this quote because, see, they're being enticed into this worship. They're being lulled and sucked into this worship. He, she said this in Patriarchs and Prophets. He immediately returned to the land of Moab and laid his plans before the king. We're talking about Balaam. What page? Uh, this is a Patriarchs and Prophets Elder, page 451, paragraph 4. I'm just taking a portion of it. 451, paragraph 4. Okay. It says he immediately returned to the land of Mo, uh, to the land of Moab and laid his plans before the king, king of Moab. The Moabites themselves were convinced that so long as Israel remained true to God, he would be their shield. The plan proposed by Balaam was to separate them from God by enticing them into idolatry. If they could be led to engage in licentious worship of Baal and Asherah, their omnipotent protector would become their enemy, and they would soon fall a prey to the fierce, warlike nations around them. This plan was readily accepted by the king, and Balaam himself remained to assist and mm -hmm. to effect. So... Wow. What was Balaam's doctrine? Basically, he was teaching them to commit sin, uh, to licentiousness, whoredom. Okay? Mm -hmm. And before being led into idolatry, what sin did Satan entice Israel to commit according to uh, Numbers 5 1? Whoredom. Mm -hmm. Licentiousness. Uh, I'm going to read this quote also from Patriarchs and Prophets, Elder, a couple pages over, 458. Paragraph one, a portion of it. Satan seduced Israel into licentiousness, which is whoredom, before leading them into idolatry. Those who will dishonor God's image and defile his temple in their own persons will not scruple at any dishonor to God that will gratify the desires of their depraved hearts. Sensual indulgence weakens the mind and the base is the soul. The moral and intellectual powers are benumbed and paralyzed by the gratifications of the animal propensities. And it is impossible for the slave of passion to realize the sacred obligations of the law of God, to appreciate the atonement, or to place a right value upon the soul. Goodness, purity, and truth, reverence for God, and love for sacred things, all those holy affections and noble desires that link men with the heavenly world are consumed in the fires of lust. Mm -hmm. The soul becomes a blackened and desolate waste. The habitation of the evil spirits in the cage of every unclean and hateful bird being formed in the image of God are dragged down to a level with brute beasts. And we know that she is thinking also about uh, Revelations 18 and also in Jude that deals with uh, with this. Uh, and also Balaam in Jude. And now what was the name of... Uh, wait a minute. I got lost my place a little bit. Hold on one second. Bro, Troy, while you're there, while you're look, getting your thought there, yes, um, sir. when you read in Numbers chapter 23, when Balaam went to uh, first went to curse Israel, you know, he couldn't do it. And it says, right. there, he, he says that I have found no iniquity in Jacob, neither Amen. have I seen perverseness in Israel. So yes. as long as they were faithful to God, there was nothing that Balaam nor Satan could do. And the Amen. same thing goes for us today. As we're Amen. faithful to God, there's nothing Satan can do. Amen. So he had to introduce this doctrine. Yeah. And once he got them to doing what he wanted them to do, it was on. Done deal. It says, what was the name of one of the men who followed the doctrine of Balaam? According to uh, Numbers 25, 
14. Zimri? Omri? Yeah. Zimri, yes. Amen. Okay. Ding, 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 ding. But Brian, get the prize. <laughs> <laughs> There's a quote from Patriarchs and Prophets, Brother Brian. It says, okay. the and because this will be important. Now, see, here's the thing. What was Zimri's position, though? I'm going he was somewhere. one of the elders. Amen. Remember in Ezekiel, beginning with the elders? Okay. Yeah. They, they, they're the, look, if, 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 if the parents don't teach you better, the leaders don't teach you better, then you're probably not going to do any better. That's why it says that God says when he says when we reject the knowledge of God, he's going to reject you and your children. And yeah. you should preach unto me seeing that you have rejected my law. But she says this, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 455, no, page 55, 455, paragraph 1. Page 455, paragraph 1. It's, and also, I'm going to read this little portion, too, from uh, Patriarchs and Prophets 454, paragraph 4. It says, the rulers and leading men were among the first to transgress. And so wow. many of the people were guilty that the apostasy became national. Israel joined himself unto be uh, Baal Peor, which we read that just a minute ago. It says, uh, there in, in uh, Patriarchs and Prophets 455, paragraph one, their iniquitous practices did that for Israel, which all the enchantments of Balaam could not do. Right. They separated them from God. By swift coming judgments, the people were awakened to the enormity of their sin. A terrible pestilence broke out in the camp to which ten, tens of thousands speedily fell a prey. God Ooh. commanded that the leaders in this apostasy be put to death by the magistrates. This order was promptly obeyed. The offenders were slain. Then their bodies were hung up in sight of all Israel that the congregation, seeing the leaders so severely dealt with, might have a deep sense of God's abhorrence of their sin and the terror of his wrath against them. And let that sit on your mind for a minute. Yeah. As they say in Psalms, Selah. Amen. So you know, Brother Troy also, Yes, sir. Uh, if I if I may remember, some forty years ago, God told Moses that nobody twenty years old and over was going to go into the promised land. Right now, numbers forty, numbers twenty four and twenty five, they're about to cross over. Yes, so we know what God, we're going to do there too. But go ahead. Right? No, man, go ahead. You do your thing. Now go ahead, Bill. It's just going to reinforce. Let's okay. keep yeah, keep your thoughts so, going. You in harmony. All right, so so those people who were 20 years or older, they had to die. Now, it wasn't God's desire, nor his plan, nor his will, but because of rebellion, because of disbelief, they had to die. Amen. They couldn't go Amen. And we're going to talk about that in a few more questions because uh, Satan is going to tempt us before we cross over into the heavenly kingdom. Amen. So, like what, what Brother Brian was highlighting, this is why it's important for us to understand God's leading in the past. Amen. So we'll understand the times and know what to do. Okay. It says, so which other doctrine did the church of per Pergamos also hold according to Revelations 2.15? It was another doctrine too. Now I'm merging the doctrine of Balaam with the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which we know God hates. So the other doctrine that the church held, along with that of the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel and to eat things sacrificed unto idols, Remember, we read in Psalms how they bowed to idols and thus Israel joined themselves unto Baal Peor. And yeah. so we see also another doctrine on the scenes, which we saw this doctrine also popping his head up in the church of uh, Ephesus, 
which is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And in this quote, she actually gives us a good definition of what it is because she comes right out and says what it is. And this is one portion of this is taken from Review and Herald. And then I have a portion taken from Bible Commentary uh, 957, uh, paragraph 6. And it says this in Review and Herald, June 7, 1887. June 7, 1887, Review and Herald. It is our work to know our special fallings and sins, which cause darkness and spiritual feebleness and quench our first love. We know that happened to the church of Ephesus and we found out that it was worldliness that caused that, right? right. It is selfishness. Is it the love of self-esteem? Is it striving to be first? Who shall be the greatest, right? It is, it is the sin of sensuality that is insensi uh, in intensely active. It is the sin of the Nicolaitans, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. It is the misuse and abuse of great light and opportunities and privileges, making boasted claims to wisdom and religious knowledge, while the life and character are inconsistent and immoral. Whatever it is that has been petted and cultivated until it has become strong and overmastering, make determined efforts to overcome. Mm -hmm. Or else you will be lost. And I took that to heart. I said, Lord, I better get to fight because this thing is serious. The doctrine is now largely taught that the gospel of Christ has made the law of God of no effect that by believing we are released from the necessity of being doers of the word. But this is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which Christ so unsparingly condemned. And that's taken from a review and herald and Bible commentary 7, 957, paragraph 6. But Christ don't always have bad stuff to say. Even uh, every time he says something that he's going to do this, he also gives us words of encouragement because he yeah. admonishes the church. In Revelation 2.16, somebody read that for me. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Amen. So he admonishes us to repent or else right? Mm -hmm. That's what he said. Repent or else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or else I'm going to do this. And we know he said, I'm going to come and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And we just read what the sword of his mouth was. Hebrews 4. And also we saw in Matthew uh, that sword that's going to come out of his mouth and fight against us. Right? right? So what was the location of the people of Israel when Balak caused Balaam to curse them in Numbers 22-1? But Brad, we were just there. I meant to tell y'all the whole thing in Numbers. We're going to be here a All little right. bit. Numbers 22-1 says... And the children of Israel set forward and pitched in the plain of Moab on this side, Jordan, by Jericho. Oh, man. Sound like they closely crossing over. Yeah, they were in the land of Moab. And the land was just about ready. They close yeah. to, the, to, the, to, the, to the place. That's what Brother Brian was talking about. Mm. Right? Yeah. And what was Satan attempt to do when we get ready to cross over to the heavenly Canaan, and I took this quotation, I'm gonna use two parts, because I'm connecting this also. Uh, well, I'm gonna take this quotation from Patriarchs and Prophets about this crossing over. It says, as we approach the close of time, as the people of God stand upon the borders of the heavenly Canaan, this is Patriarchs and Prophets 457, paragraph three, page 457, paragraph three. And it says, as we approach the, uh, the close of time, as the people of God stand upon the borders of the heavenly Canaan, Satan will, as of old, redouble his efforts to prevent them from entering the goodly land. 
He lays his snares for every soul. Is it not the ignorant and uncultured? Is, uh, it is not, I'm sorry, the ignorant and uncultured merely that need to be guarded. He will prepare his temptations for those in the highest positions, in the most holy office. If he can lead them to pollute their souls, like Zimri did, right? He can, through them, destroy many. And he employs the same agents now as he employed 3,000 years ago by worldly friendships. That's really how they crept in. Mm -hmm. That's how Balaam got them in there. Yeah. By worldly friendships, by the charms of beauty. Remember them women? Mm. That's why I highlighted the women. By pleasing, <laughs> pleasure-seeking. Myrrh. We ain't talking about godly women. We talking about them fishnet stockings and high heels. By pleasure-seeking, myrrh, feasting, or the wine cup, he tempts to the violation of the seventh commandment. And we know what that one is, right? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Boredom. Licentiousness. Right? So we got him going to that party. Got to the party. Drinking, huh? Having a good time. Getting men, getting women. I mean, they doing it up. Having a ball until judgment came and then they were snapped to their senses. And all this started Zimri, which was one of the uh, leading princesses and one of the uh, head uh, families in Israel. Uh, it was, uh, let me see here, let me go back. How long are they gonna go? Zimri. How long are they gonna go? The prince of a chief house, the Semenites. Right? That's the tribe he was from. Right? Yeah. The name of the Midianitish woman that he hooked up with was a uh, Cosby, the Zor daughter of Zor. He was a head over people too. And the chief of a house in Midian. Uh, you know how Hollywood people do. So they got together and had this unholy alliance. And it mm -hmm. caused the wrath of God to come down on the children of Israel because now they are involved in whoredom. Okay? Mm -hmm. And yeah. I feel like Can I share something, Brother Troy? Yes, you can. Uh, Testimonies, Volume 5, page uh, 298. Yes, sir. It says, some profess Christianity year after year, and in some things appear to serve God, and yet they are far from him. They give loose rein to appetite and passion and follow their own unsanctified inclinations, loving pleasure and the applause of men more than God or his truth. Paul says, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Uh, pri uh, yeah, 2 Timothy 3. I'm, I'm going because I'm messing it up. 2 Timothy 3. 5, rather. 2 Timothy chapter 5. 3. Yeah. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And verse 1, it says there, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and holy, without natural affection. And that's what we're seeing so much today. Truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. And verse 5 says, Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. In these last days, Amen. we're told that the last two prevailing sins will be appetite and passion. I was talking Amen. to a brother last evening, and he said his, his wife was at, as, was at a store, a shop, and something came on the TV called Married at First Sight. Oh, yes. Oh, you know about that? 
I've heard of it. I hadn't watched it. Okay. But Married at first it. sight. And so if marriage is one of the institutions brought out of eat out of at out of Eden, one that would represent the union between God and his church, Satan has got to pervert it. Yes, that's what he, he was doing. With, he, he did it with the homosexual, the LGBT community, and now he's doing it uh, in the right way with a man and a woman. Amen. Well, supposedly. He's also perverting it by having women's ordination. All right. Ooh. Yeah, that sounds like a woman in a woman's marriage, too, because a woman is represented as a church, and then you have women's ordination, which is also a woman. <laughs> <laughs> which also brings most of the time these movements are led by these type of women who brought in the rest of the LBGT community. It is the woman who is convincing the man, hey, that's cool to be this way. And oftentimes you find women yoked up with homosexual men as good friends and they applaud their decision to be that way. And that's been my experience in life anyway. I've always found that a lot of Homosexual men have a lot of girlfriends, too. Mm. You know, All right. I know that from the streets. <laughs> mm -hmm. So homosexual men got girlfriends, <laughs> which is a problem, which is going to bring in a whole lot of order, <laughs> for a lack of better words. Okay, so I would like to change gear just a little bit and deal with a thought on this hidden manner. Because we see uh, what happened, the doctrine that uh, Balaam, who taught Balak to cast his stumbling block before the children of Israel and to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication, according to Revelations. And uh, Numbers, it says, they committed whoredom. Same thing. Same thing. And also, they had the doctrine of Nic of the Nicolaitans, which thing I also hate. And we know that doctrine is, uh, in short, to make void the law of God and to make the gospel of none effect. And that's the whole plan. That was the plan of uh, sending the Moabite women into the children of Israel to make everything they, are do they were doing none effect by causing them to get in opposition with their maker and making God their enemy. Mm. So this hidden manner, what is this hidden manner for those who overcome? Now I want to point us, let's go to John 6, 48. And what's the time, everybody? I don't want to be too long. 7.03. 703. Okay, we can finish this up then in a few minutes. What is the hidden manner for those who overcome, according to John 6? Jesus said, I am the bread of life. 48. Yes, 48 through 51, but Elder. Okay. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give him is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Mm. Amen. That manner, patriarchs and prophets, connecting to Revelations 2.17, patriarchs and prophets, 2.97, paragraph 2. And I'm connecting this to that thought. The manna fallen from heaven for the substance of Israel was a type of him, Christ, who came from God to give life to the world, said Jesus, I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Among the promises of blessings to God's people in the future life, it is written, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. So let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 8, three, verse 3, verse 16, and let's see 
Why this manna is called it's hidden. Manna. Manna. It's hidden. What's that scripture? The manna is hidden. Hidden manna. Deuteronomy. It's Deuteronomy 8, verse 3, 16. This hidden manna. I'm going there too. Could it be? Yeah, Deuteronomy 8. I love this chapter 2. Deuteronomy 8, 3, 16. This could also be connected to Matthew 4 and 4. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 3 and verse 16. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knowest not neither did thy father know that he might make thee known that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord, doth men live. Amen. 16. 16. Who fed thee? Who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy father knew not, no, knew not, that he might humble thee, and that he might prove thee to do thee good. At thy latter end. Man. So it was called uh, hidden manner because they knew not what it was. They didn't know what it was. Mm. So, so this hidden manner, they didn't know what it was. That's what God mm. says he's going to give us, revelations. Hey, man, here's the thought. Go ahead, El. Could Could that hidden manner what was in the Ark of the Testament? Amen. Uh, the manna. Okay. So could that hidden manna, because no one was able to look into the Ark, could the well, hidden you, manna be well, the manna that God uh, preserved in the Ark of the Covenant, man? Amen. So go to Hebrews 9, 3, and 4, D. Uh-oh. Okay. Read this. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. That's where it was. Amen. Praise God. Hmm. And so we finna close in on this last thought, this promise that is given to those who overcome in Revelations 2.17. And I'll read that. And somebody give me Isaiah 62 and 2. Revelations 2.17. He that hath an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit say unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, which the fathers of that day didn't know. They didn't know what it was. And I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth. See that? Also, yeah. which no man knoweth, save he that receiveth it. Isaiah 62 and 2. And the, and the Gentiles see thy righteousness and all kings the glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Amen. He's going to give us that new name. Amen. Praise God. As a matter of fact, it says, and thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the land in the hand of the Lord, in a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. And thou shalt no longer be termed forsaken, neither shall the land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hezbah, the land, and Beulah, for the Lord delighteth in thee, and the land shall be married. Amen. 
It's all about yeah. this match. And then here's the last thought right here from Great Controversy. Uh, 645. This is from the 88 edition. 645, paragraph 3. It says, before entering the city of God, the Savior bestows upon his followers the emblems of victory and invests them with the insignia of their royal state. The glittering ranks are drawn up in the form of a hollow square about the king. And we know around the sanctuary, that's how the children of Israel were uh, arrayed around the sanctuary, like a uh, holy square around the sanctuary. Okay, and it says about the king whose form rises in majesty high above saints and angels. And also remember his throne is high and lifted up. So we have, you know, you have the sanctuary, I mean, the city of Jerusalem. And then when you come to the throne of God, it's like it goes way up. <laughs> up high, way yeah. up there. You just don't go Man. going through a door. You got to go up still, <laughs> even in the kingdom. You still got to go up to get to him, and it says, whose form rises in majesty high above saints and angels, whose countenance beams upon them full of benignant love. Throughout the unnumbered host of the redeemed, every glance is fixed upon him. Every eye beholds his glory, whose visage, visage was so marred more than any man, and his form, form more than the sons of men, Upon the heads of overcomers, Jesus, with his own right hand, places the crown of glory. Amen. There is a crown bearing his own new name. Revelations 2.17 and the inscription, holiness to the Lord. And so when I thought about that, you know, him still bearing those marks and seeing, oh, have mercy on us, Jesus. What what he went through to save us, and how mm -hmm. our sins so brutally damaged and hurt our Lord, and he so lovingly, yet still receives us and hugs us and tells us how much he cares, man, and blows my mind. My heart fainted when I read that, because I can almost see it. I can feel it. I can feel the pain that he went through to save us and the agony, just the thought of what he did and, and how he suffered and bled and died for things that we did. Mm -hmm. Lord, forgive us and have mercy. We're so sorry. We don't, like you said, like he said before he died, Father, forgive us. Forgive yeah. us. We don't know what we're doing. Ain't no soundness in our mind. We've lost it. So in the just, you know, highlighting everything, uh, he tells the church in his approval, hold fast his name. And he has, to them that it has not denied his faith, he tells them who held the doctrine of his reproof to those who held the doctrine of Balaam in uh, Revelation 2, 14 is that we are to repent or he will fight against them with the sword of his mouth. And his call is to hearken unto the spirit. In Revelation 2, 17, it says, uh, he that had an ear to hear, let him hear what the spirit say unto the churches. To him that overcome will I give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone and in the, in the stone, a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. And that will be our memory verse. Amen. For study. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Father, we are so sorry for what we've done and how we've joined ourselves unto the world and have turned our backs on the sanctuary and worshiped the sun, moon, and stars, O oh Lord. Father God, we, every man is gone in his own way 
and in that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Lord, there is none righteous, no, not even one. Lord, we all need you. We can't get along without you. Lord, we can't make it without you. You are the strength of our life, O oh Lord. Lord, you are all in all. You are a shelter from the storm. You are rock, O oh Lord. You are water in dry places, Heavenly Father. You are a hedge of protection, both seen and unseen dangers, sicknesses and disease, O oh Lord, that ravish our world because of sin. It is the cause and effect. Lord, sin is the cause. And as a bird wandering and as a swallow flieth, O oh Lord, Have mercy on us, Father. Yes, Lord. Forgive us, O oh Lord, of our sins. Yes, Lord. Let this word be hid in our hearts. Let us remember what happened to the children of Israel in their day. Lord, let us not forget your leading in the plat in the past and how much and how you truly do hate and abhor sin. I pray that if we learn to even as Christ learned to love righteousness and hate iniquity. Yes, Lord. Father God, we're asking for a new heart. Yes, Lord. Father God, we're asking for a new mind, that the mind that we ask that we receive the mind of Christ. Lord, you yes. said that to let this mind be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to make himself equal with his father, but he humbled himself. And so, Lord, I pray that we humble our hearts to learn from you, to take from your word and to apply to our lives that self-will and selfishness will put, be put out of our lives, oh Lord, that we may be, be able to follow you more fully, to sacrifice, to put it all on the altar, Lord God, to be a living sacrifice, to do that which is pleasing in thy sight, oh Lord that you may be able to bless us, that you may be able to pour out your spirit upon us. Yes, Lord. So, Lord, we pray, O oh Lord, for your divine mercy. Lord, we realize and know that you delight in mercy and that you desire us to repent. So, Father God, I'm asking that you give us repentance, Father. We're asking for repentance and reformation. Father, give us repentance for sin. Yes, Lord. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And Father God, I'm praying for every family represented here tonight, uh, for my brothers and sisters. I pray that your uh, divine grace and mercy be manifested to them all tonight, the family members, that each one, as we've been listening and going through the word, that we be salt and light uh, in our spirit and on those who come in contact with us, who know us or don't know us. Uh, that your glory may be revealed. As you said, if you be lifted up, you will draw all men unto you. So, Father God, I pray that you be lifted up in our hearts, that we uh, keep you, your law and your word as frontless before our eyes, that we hang it about our neck as a garland, O oh Lord, that we uh, make it first in our lives, that we prize it as we would hidden treasure, O oh Lord that we will look unto the hills from which cometh thy help, Lord. And without you, we know we can do nothing. So, Father, we thank you for this study. Thank you for my brothers and sisters. Let your spirit continue to work on our hearts each day, O oh Lord. Until we come again, we thank you for your many wonderful blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.